Well, thank you, everyone. My name is Kimberly Dudick. I'm thrilled to have people here. We also have people watching on channel 189 streaming, and people may also watch this later. I think there's a few people in the lobby right now still getting popcorn, so they might be trickling in. I'm Kimberly Dudick, and I'm happy to have you here. I am the president and CEO of the Public Policy Institute of the Rockies, I'm also an attorney and former, uh, former lawmaker. And tonight we are going to be talking about the dark days of reproductive rights before abortion was fully legal in Montana, so before 1973. Uh, this presentation is being recorded by Missoula Community Access Television as part of a media assistance grant donated to Pipper by MCAT. And we're also thankful to AAUW for providing a sponsorship for this. Knowing the history of abortion and knowing our Montana history is important. It's important because we need to know what's happened in the past because the past is the best predictor of the future. And we can see what's happened with reproductive rights in Montana and unfortunately we're seeing some of the same past repeat itself already in other states. The information provided tonight is important because in June of this year, the US Supreme Court decided in infinite wisdom to overturn Roe versus Wade. Hold on a second, this popped out. And in overturning Roe versus Wade, it took away the federal protections for abortion rights and left it up to states. So here in Montana, we are fortunate because our state provides protections, which I'll talk about later, but it has not always been that way. And we are now going to hear from Senator Diane Sands about the history in Montana. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about Diane. She's my friend. I've served with her for eight years in the legislature, but she is much more than just my friend and a great legislator. Diane was born in St. Ignatius, Montana, and obtained a BA in anthropology from the University of Montana. She also completed... <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. She also completed graduate work at George Washington University. Sands um, began her career at the Montana State Legislature in 1996. She was appointed as the Democratic nominee for the Montana House of Representatives in the 66th District. This is in Missoula County. In 2006, Diane ran again to succeed Tom Facey in the 95th District, again in Missoula County, and was re-elected four times in 2008, 2010, 2012, and 2014. She was then elected to the Montana Senate, and she is serving out her final term in the Senate where she was elected in 2018. Deanne is a, not only a legislator, she's a celebrated historian, she's a wealth of knowledge, and she's a champion for women and for the LGBTQ plus community in Montana. Deanne was foundational in establishing the Women's Center at the University of Montana, as well as establishing the Women's Studies Program and at the university. It is now known as the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Program. She's been involved in many history projects involving Montana, including one about the history of World War II's internment camp at Fort Missoula. Today, she's going to be talking with us about the history of reproductive rights and abortion in Montana. And there is, when you're going through the lobby, there is a nice placard she put together with showing some pictures and some history, including the names of women who have died from abortion care in Montana. So with that, I would like to please have you well and join me in welcoming Diane Sands. Thanks, Kim. Glad to see you all. Some old faces and a few new faces. Um, thanks for coming. Yeah, one of the things relative to the legislature is there's a little period in there where I actually did uh, a lot of lobbying on abortion issues starting back in... 1974. In fact, the reason I switched from being a sort of student community radical to getting involved in the electoral system was because of abortion. In 1974, when Montana, after Roe, was looking at the Abortion Control Act and rewriting it, and I was sitting up in the balcony, I think with Deb Franson, and I looked down there and I said, those people are going to decide if women, which women are going to die, and I'm not going to let them do it. So I was the uh, founder of Montanans for Choice is what we called it at the time, became NARAL, was its lobbyist, and uh, also founded the Reproductive Rights Coalition. So, and then as part of the Montana Women's Lobby, we lobbied uh, for many years, 30 years, on behalf of reproductive choice issues. So, I've been involved in this issue for rather a long time. And it goes on. 
So yeah, in the late um, 60s, you know, I was a student here on campus, and as those of us who were becoming sexually active and aware in those days, we started looking around for information about sex, about birth control, about all those issues, and it was darn hard to find, and they weren't going to let you know it. Uh, you could go to the Student Health Center, and unless you were engaged and had a ring on your finger, they weren't even going to talk to you about birth control. In fact, they might call you names out in the waiting room. Um, so those of us who were interested in this, when we started the Women's Resource Center uh, in, I don't know, 68 maybe, uh, one of the first things we did was put together information, the pre-nursing students, on what we knew about uh, pregnancy issues and contraception, et cetera, and very quickly got ourselves some money to order the McGill handbook from, a birth control handbook from Canada, which the university then confiscated and held for ransom and would not let us distribute it because it had pictures of naked men and women in it, talked about homosexuality, it was anti-war, and it talked about abortion. So uh, we negotiated with the university, put a little strip of paper in there that said this didn't represent the view of the university and they let us have them to distribute them. But it was a tough time to be able to get information and make decisions about your life. So one of the self-help groups that we formed as the Women's Resource Center was around women's health care issues. And I don't know, Karen, if you might have been involved in that, but people who had some interest and background in health care um, started educating themselves with whatever information they could find relative to uh, issues around sexuality and reproductive health care. And so as part of that work, some of us split off and became Pregnancy Referral Service, which was a service of volunteers uh, who would educate ourselves, found research that showed where you could get a safe legal abortion, where you could get contraception, what you wanted to do if you wanted to remain pregnant and place a child for adoption, all those options. And so we formed this organization to be able to provide information to women about safe, legal, medical options. Uh, primarily, we sent women to the state of Washington in Spokane, where the Thor Clinic uh, did a fabulous job of providing health care. I remember wandering around campus collecting $5 a piece from different faculty members to drive so-and-so over to Spokane so that she could get a safe procedure. Uh, and we have a resource on that, uh, a whole resource book of other people that we use during that time, and that's over at the University Archives. Now, one thing that's interesting about that is that it was a felony at the time to actually tell women to where they could go that was safe and legal. And that shouldn't surprise you because abortion was illegal in the state going back to its founding days. I went back into the revised codes of Montana for 1947. And from 1871, our first statute having to do with abortion is uh, pretty much definitive for 100 years. Administering drugs with the intent to produce a miscarriage. Every person who provides supplies or administers any pregnant woman or any procedure for a woman to take a, medic, a medicine, drug, or assistance, or uses or employs any instrument or any other means to procure a miscarriage for such woman, unless it's necessary to preserve her life, is punishable with imprisonment in the state prison for not less than two or more than five years. That literally goes back to Bannock, 1871. In addition to that, it was a felony, it was, um, so it's a misdemeanor. Um, it also is a crime for a woman to submit to, even to attempt to produce a miscarriage. And that penalty is not less than one or more than five years. And that goes back to 1895. Now, for those of us who were just assisting, there is the advising, advertising to produce mi miscarriages from 1895. And this is what affected us, that in, if you uh, published any notice or advertisement, about how to facilitate a miscarriage or an abortion, or for the prevention of contraception, even, of conception, or who offers the services in any way, advertisement or whatever, is guilty of a misdemeanor. So that's 1895. So um, what we were doing was actually criminal, and we were well aware of it, but uh, we did it anyway, as we did so often in those days. So from that, work, uh, I was doing a lot of just general women's history interviews, and I would ask women about how many children you had, how did you decide how many children you're going to have, what did you do relative to that. So a lot of women talked to me about, you know, well, my husband was a considerate man, he, we only had sex once or twice a month, and 
that sort of thing. And other people talk to me about pessaries or getting a recipe from their sister-in-law from the druggist to make a little uh, waxen cap to put in, or they would douche with Lysol and other kinds of very um, toxic products. So when I was doing women's history, one of the suggestions was that this was an area which we have very little history about. And I think it's partly because women's reproductive history is considered to be, as women were at the time, in the private sphere. You know, this was about your private life, so it's really not very much of interest to history anyway because, you know, women get pregnant and have babies, women have get pregnant, have babies, yeah, what's so interesting about that? And of course, men were mostly the historians and they were not gonna approach this topic. So there really wasn't that much about it at the time. And so uh, I jumped right in and we applied to the Montana Committee for the Humanities, which gave us in 1979, $10,000 to go out there and pursue this topic, primarily as an oral history because at the time we didn't think there were really many, well there certainly weren't books and there weren't many resources on this that we thought the majority of the resources would be oral histories. Come to find out, oh, there are lots of other records. There are coroner's reports and death certificates. And so we focused um, on six of the major towns in Montana. I looked at every death certificate for an adult woman from the beginning of time to 1970, till Roe, 73. I looked at a lot of coroner's reports, trial transcripts, and other resources. So there are more out there to be found if anyone wants to continue to pursue this. So as a result, we compiled a list of 42 women who we believe died of illegal abortions in Montana, um, and a list of about 27 to 30 persons who I consider to have been abortionists, or who were strongly suspected of being illegal abortionists and records of eight of these people who were pursued through the legal system. And of those, three of them were convicted and spent time in the state prison. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of them. You know, in some ways this is an educated guess because, um, well, the coroner's uh, reports really go in depth into what the procedure was. Those are very clearly abortions. But on death certificates, what you would find is the same name of the same doctor signing off on one after another after another of a woman who died of a procedure done three to five days in the uh, prior period and died of septicemia. Um, you know, I mean, so they become fairly routine that you'll see the same names over and over again. And that's one of the ways that we identified a number of the people who were abortionists. That's not to say that there weren't other doctors who um, disguised in some ways the cause of death here, but the coroners are the ones who fill out those forms. And they uh, very clearly understood these were abortions. But that did not necessarily result in any action. Uh, the illegality of this really is what created, I think, the silencing of the community, the medical providers, and the women about this procedure. All of you out there who've ever been pregnant, thought you were pregnant, um, know how time sensitive this issue is. That the challenge, if you did want to terminate a pregnancy, is really to find a medically competent abortionist before the end of the first trimester where you barely know you're pregnant. And it requires secrecy and deception and you have to try to figure out who knows this information because they didn't advertise for the most part. So you have to find out who you knew that was kind of in that world or someone you knew who was sexually active and probably that kind of a woman and she might be able to tell you. I found pharmacists were a great source um, for those uh, referrals actually. But in the end, uh, it was a game of Russian roulette because you could find yourself in a wonderful position with like Dr. Sadie Lindeberg from Miles City, a physician, very competent, practiced at the uh, Holy Rosary Hospital in Miles City for many years, delivered 4,000 babies, Miles City's Woman of the Year, uh, much beloved, very competent. Um, or you could find yourself in the clutches of a classic back alley, although he wasn't a uh, back alley at all, Dr. Williamson from up in Shelby, um, who at some point was probably competent, but by the time I found him and talked to people who'd been to him. He was clearly an alcoholic, bloody sponges, food dripping down the front. Um, really your worst um, image of an illegal abortionist. 
And then you have people here in town like uh, Rose Husted, and we'll talk more about her at length, um, who lived over on Eda Street, who had no medical training whatsoever. And of course, then a number of her pregnancies uh, that she worked on, and it resulted in deaths. So uh, the impact of this was really terrifying. And one Missoula woman said in one of the interviews, I am aware now how demeaning it was. The whole thing was so shameful. You had to go away, you had to keep it secret, you had to pretend it never happened. And another woman said, I saw myself in that situation as victimized and trapped. When it was over, I said, if I have anything to do about it, this is never going to happen to anyone that I know ever again. And that was really the motivation of those of us who worked on this to make sure that abortion became legal and we have worked for the last 50 years to keep abortion legal and safe for women, that we must never endanger the lives of women again. All women need to have the right to a safe, legal abortion. Now, what became interesting here, I'm gonna talk about three kind of aspects of it. One is certainly the reality of the women who uh, I have records on. Second are the medical providers. And third, the larger community, which is something I hadn't thought about when we first got into this, but the fact that you have an underworld, a criminal underworld that is operating and that everybody knows that it's there. The law enforcement know about it. Uh, the doctors know about it. You know, people in town know about it. They just don't talk about it in general unless you ask them specific questions. But the extent of that silencing and what that does to the women themselves, to the medical professionals, and to the community is, I think, one of the most unexamined but dangerous parts of this. And I'll start with that to some degree. Some of these doctors, I think, might have been very competent and intentional and well-intentioned, particularly at the beginning, but to never be able to speak of it with your peers or with anyone, ever. What does that do to your sense of being part of a larger medical community? You're a pariah acting over on the side. Um, so I think that's a huge factor in why some of these providers are um, really bad medical providers. A lot of them just plain aren't medical providers at all. That's another issue. But, and then for the women themselves, for a number of the women I talked to, they had never talked about this to, with anyone in their entire life other than their spouse. I was the first person they may have ever talked about it. And I think that's still an issue today. If we don't open our mouths, if one in four women have had an abortion in this country and we don't stand up and say our names and talk about it, um, that's on us because um, we need to claim this experience and, and claim this right as a normal part of our life. So, and in that, when I was doing research on this topic in the early days in, when I was in D.C. in graduate school, I was looking at abortion and infanticide in other countries around the world. And several of the cross-cultural anthropologists who work in this area have said that they could not even imagine a society in which abortion did not exist because every society wants to control its reproduction. You have families, women and men, who need to make decisions about how many children can you actually provide for in nomadic tribes, how many children can you support with di severe disabilities. You know, so infanticide, uh, contraception, and abortion are all part of that a set of rights that families from the beginning of time have had to deal with in deciding when to have children, uh, how many children to have, and how to control their reproduction. The most common form of birth control, of course, always was consideration, as they put it. Uh, worked to some degree for some people, but for others they would have to deal with the reality of unwanted pregnancies, and in other cases the birth of severely deformed, uh, non-viable children that they would have to deal with. So all of those are very complicated issues. I won't go into some of them, but it is interesting when you put it in that larger context of, of human society that this is not something that's unusual. It is in every society. And whether it is officially approved of or not, it is tolerated because it is a necessity. Some people in the modern medical world talk about it as a necessary evil. I would not say it's a necessary evil. I would say it is a necessary good and that it has done, been good in women's and families' lives to have these choices, however dangerous they sometimes may be. So. Um, 
with that, let me talk a little bit about uh, some of the women that we interviewed. Um, well, let me start with the abortionists, because I think they're in some ways more complicated. People have stereotypes about who the abortionists were. We came across, in the process of this, of about 27, 28 people that I consider to have been doing more than one or two abortions. Uh, they were people who, who did it as a business on an ongoing basis. Of those, we have um, five who were women. Two were MDs and three were irregular physicians. Now, most of you who know anything about the history of abortion know that a good part of making abortion illegal in this country was really around the regular physicians trying to control irregular physicians, um, midwives, uh, chiropractors, uh, osteopaths, and other people who were also doing abortions during this time. And so when you get into seeing who is actually pursued by the medical profession and who is pursued by the legal profession and put out of business or tried, they are almost always irregular physicians and women. So among the women, uh, three of them, uh, Rose Husted here in Missoula, barely had any kind of lay uh, midwife experience. Gertrude Pitcannon, whose husband was a doctor who did abortions for many years in Butte, she then took up the business. She was trained as a nurse. And Lavella Petresh, who was my, one of my grandmother's good friends in Bozeman, she was a, a chiropractor, charter member of the John Birch Society, and did many abortions in her life and uh, was uh, tried for one of the abortions, which she told my grandmother she had not done that one. She'd done a lot, but she didn't do that one. Dr. Bayless, well, she was out of the Baxter Hotel. Bayless, who owned Houses of Prostitution in West Yellowstone, worked out of the um, Bozeman Hotel, where he ran prostitution on a couple floors and then did abortions on the other floor. And uh, he was never charged, but she was, and she spent her life savings and all. It put her out of business. She couldn't, uh, the legal fees, which is normally what happened when they were charged. Even if it didn't go to trial, it basically put them out of business. So um, of those, uh, Pitt Cannon is the one who, if you, did any of you get the Montana Journal? It comes out monthly. It's in hotel rooms. I just picked one up last week and found in there an article about one of the perennial people people do know about, which is Gertrude Pitt Cannon. And she was from Butte, and as I said, her doctor was an, her husband was an MD and an abortionist. And when he died, she being a nurse took over his business. She is famous for um, delivering babies for women and in many cases turning them over to adoptive parents. And these women are, uh, or these children are now known as Gertie's babies. And the whole issue of whether they were sold or not becomes a big issue. And there's a placement fee. She certainly makes money over placing these children with other, other folks. But these women and men have now found each other through DNA and other kinds of things and, and birth records being open. So it's pretty interesting. If you want to look at the Montana Quarterly for this month, you'll find an entire article about Gertrude Pitt Cannon, and her picture is out there as well. She was, however, uh, there were three coroner's inquests into three deaths that her name is signed on to. Um, these three women... Each of them were older women, 29 to 39. Uh, she got arrested, and then, but the inquest, there was no doubt this was an illegal operation, but none of them were ever pursued. Now that raised the whole issue that I found in several other places, particularly the work I did in Miles City and Bozeman, um, that law enforcement and others were also being bought off. Um, there's every indication that there's, when you operate in the underworld, I don't know if you've ever spent any time in the underworld, I, sort of like that area in some ways. Uh, when you go find that underworld, they're all kind of together. In, in this era, it is drugs, prostitution, gambling, and abortion are all found co-located in certain parts of town. You young people probably don't know that we used to have parts of town where that sort of thing went on. And people knew where it was, and uh, that's where you went if you wanted to be involved in some of those kinds of activities. So. For um, Gertrude Pitt Cannon, a lot of her work involved dealing with houses of prostitution in Butte, and several of the women that I had talked to and interviewed said, yeah, they had gone to Pitt Cannon, and um, even though she never told them who she was. But she would frequently have women sign saying they were already miscarrying, and then she would do procedures on them. But she did have a fair number of them 
that died. So I had to look at, so if this person's name is showing up on a number of death certificates, is that because they're really providing horrible medical service or is it because of the volume they are doing? And that's kind of a judgment call, I would say, because um, I wasn't there and neither were you and it's kind of hard to know because no one's in that room in these cases except the abortionist and the woman herself. But the buying off by these providers of law enforcement and others, I think is quite certain in a couple of cases. In Bozeman, for example, from Lavella Petrosh's case, um, one of the former sheriff's wife, whom I knew from childhood, talked to me and said, oh yeah, an envelope of cash would show up about once a week on the door, and that was the deal, she said. It was just a little bit of cash there. You just look the other way. Unless you were really pressed to do something for extraordinary reasons, you look the other way. So the tolerance of an outlaw community, I think, is one of the big issues that needs to be raised if we're going to allow for another illegal abortion community to exist. And do you want to tolerate that? One of the county attorneys that I talked to about that said that was his biggest concern was the corruption of the legal system. In a case I'll talk about later with a Helena uh, abortionist, Dr. Kellogg tried four times, bought off a jury, bought off a judge, um, jury tampering, etc. Clearly cases of money being exchanged there and tolerated. So, I mean, it's just part of the reality of the criminal outlaw world is the corruption of the system. Now, we all think of law enforcement, et cetera, as providing a little barrier and safety net for those of us who don't engage in that world, but that world is there. And uh, if abortion becomes illegal again, that world is going to be expanded and it'll be hooked into all of these other criminal areas I can lay you money. So, um, so we talked a little bit about Gertrude Pitcannon, Lavella Patrosh. Uh, like I said, she was tried, but she was acquitted, and she spent the rest of her life out of business paying off those bills. Nobody touched Dr. Ballas. Male doctors are generally not a target of this kind of persecution and prosecution. Rose Husted here is the other one. She. Um, found her out from a farmer's union lobbyist who turned out to be her nephew. Uh, and she lived over on Edith and she really had no training whatsoever, as I said. But she was doing abortions and it was a deathbed convention of a woman who developed septicemia and was admitted to the hospital in Ronan, a Catholic hospital, where a priest heard her last confession. And as a condition of that, had her sign a statement that Rose Husted had done the procedure on pain of loss of her immortal soul, I would assume. So, I mean, I do know that the Catholic Diocese has a file on these topics, although they're not willing to share them, but they have been told, I've been told that they have them, where priests are told this information from women who have had abortions and the role of the Catholic Church on that's another issue that should be pursued. Other legal proceedings that went on, the last, uh, the first procedure that I found in Montana uh, where a, someone went to jail is right here in Missoula as well, Dr. Elijah Hoyt. He was a magnetic physician. Run your mind back 100 years. They had all kinds of interesting variations on medical providers. He was a magnetic physician. And so uh, he did some procedure with the wire. The woman didn't die. He was charged with malpractice and uh, was sentenced to two years in prison. His brother, Ovando Hoyt, he went then to live in Ovando uh, with uh, his brother. So we first have in Missoula, Elijah Hoyt, then we have Rose Husted, and then we have our last one in Missoula, which is Dr. Uhas in 1960. And he had attempted an abortion on Lois Jarrell, who was 32. There were two trials. The first one was a hung jury and then retired. They brought in Judge Leslie from Bozeman to do the second trial and that again, there was an acquittal. acquittal. And that was because she claimed, uh, it was claimed that she had simply miscarried because she went swimming when she was pregnant. 
You know, the difficulty in proving these is Who's to say she isn't already miscarrying? All the smart abortionists here will have a woman sign something saying, I'm spotting, I think I'm miscarrying. And then they're just going in to um, clean it out for the most part is the way they would talk about it. They also do advertise though that they will bring on your courses or restore your normal order. And that advertising does exist in spite of all of this illegality. The pills that you are frequently given include Tansy and Pennyroyal. Those are very common abortifacients. Um, ergot. Uh, so you'll be given some of those, sent home, wait for them to bring on cramping and some kind of spotting. Then you go in and they might do uh, dilatation. Uh, dilate the cervix, scrape you out, send you home. Antibiotics didn't exist until World War II. The death rate when you're looking at death certificates drops off very dramatically at that point after World War II because if you got an infection, you get antibiotics. Before that, you die. I mean, you can bleed out, but most of the deaths are related to a week of horror as you um, suffer from this massive infection. You know, the ones who thought that was important to have good abortionist providers included uh, Dr. Sid Pratt, who was the head of the Board of Health for the state and the head of the Board of Medical Examiners. When I interviewed him, he said, well, let me see your list of abortionists. I showed him the list. He said, well, you missed one. Here's a guy who was on the Board of Medical Examiners for years as an abortionist. I said, did you ever talk about it? No. He said, we talked about um, sexually transmitted diseases, but we never talked about abortion. And he had said when he was from Miles City and when he first started practicing medicine, he was horrified. He was trained in Chicago by the death of these women. And he said, I came to realize that better a trained medical provider like Dr. Sadie doing abortions than someone who didn't know what they were doing. And so one of his biggest challenges was to work with young doctors and convince them, you know, leave Dr. Sadie alone, she's doing an excellent job here. Um, and so that it's something that just had to be dealt with in society and tolerated. Now, uh, since we're in Missoula, I will just briefly, I wanna tell you the continual line in Missoula of abortions. Let me start from the top. So we get Elijah Hoyt, that's 1882. Then in the teens we have Dr. Sautel, and he was a chiropractor. Uh, Dr. William Axford in the 20s, Dr. J.T. McLaughlin in the teens and 20s, uh, Mrs. Husted in the 30s, Dr. Uhas in the 60s, Dr. Jack Daniels in the 60s and 70s. And I would argue that in almost every case, if you spend enough time and go to any one of these towns, you will have a continual line of abortionists from the beginning till Roe v. Wade, because it is a necessity in every community. You got Dr. Williamson in Shelby, you got uh, Anton Merrick up there in Glasgow. Look at his picture when you go out, his prison record. He had a fifth grade education from Yugoslavia. He was a chiropractor, a natural chiropractor of some kind. 1930s, Fort Peck Dam, and he kills a woman. Uh, Anaconda, Abortion Mary. This is another case where someone said to me, what are you doing these days, Diane? I said, hmm, working on this project. Anybody ever tell you about Abortion Mary? There she was. Uh, Shoto, Dr. Bateman, um, up in Antelope, uh, Dr. Hunter, who was tried, Butte, a whole line of them, Dr. Seavers, Dr. Witherspoon, Dr. Magnuson, Dr. Karsted, Dr. Scott, Dr. Gustavus Pitcannon, Mrs. Pitcannon, uh, Bozeman, Lavella Petrosh, and Dr. Uh, Ballas, Helena, this is one of my favorites. I was having lunch with uh, an old uh, friend in um, Montana Club, and who comes up but Blanche Judge, Governor Judge's mom. And she says, well, what are you doing these days, Diane? Said, okay. Told her, she said, did anybody tell you about the two abortionists in Helena, the one who worked on respectable women and the one who worked on the colored and the poor? No, Blanche, tell me about it. So yes, there was a, a, two of them, Dr. Savoyle, who well-respected in town, did many abortions. Um, nobody ever pursued him. And then you had Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Napoleon Savoyle, who was uh, tried four times for, and just flaunted them in their face over uh, his abortions, including the first one, the famous Masonic temple fetus 
furnace case, where he is caught throwing away fetuses into a furnace in the Masonic temple and is charged with abortion. His claim is, I'm a physician. I deal with pregnant women and miscarriages all of the time. It's not an abortion. Prove it. So that's really the case of those cases uh, with the abortionists. Now, the women who actually had abortions are pretty much what you would expect then, as is now. Of the 42 women that I talked to or got records on who were died from abortions, and most women lived, I want to say, but the women who died, half of them were married, half, about a third of them were single, the others were widows, divorced, uh, or status unknown. And this is mostly from death certificates and people who told me my aunt died, I know this woman who died, etc., and tracking them down. So of the women who are married, most of them already have three or four children. So for married women, the biggest cause for an abortion is clearly they cannot afford to have another child. Eleanor Mast, um, married in the 30s in the Depression, she and her husband had two abortions, even though they were practicing various forms of birth control, just said, I thought it was immoral to bring a child into the world we could not support. So I went twice to Butte, paid 100 bucks for each to have an abortion, I think from Pitt Cannon. The third one, they couldn't even afford that, they were so poor, and she got another ranch woman and did a self-induced abortion with what's called slippery elm, it's a stick, you soaked it in water, it's pointed, insert it through the, uh, into the uterus and hope you don't puncture the uterus, but very common form of, of self-induced abortions. Some of the other women who died, I mean, frankly, you want to go to an abortionist even if they may not the world's best because your greatest risk of death is doing a self-induced abortion. Never heard of anybody using coat hangers. Um, I've got crochet hooks. Knitting needles, a vacuum cleaner, which killed her. Um, drinking Lysol and various forms of poison. One thing I learned from one of the native medicine women I had talked to at length, she said, well, one of the things that was used was pine needle. It's turpentine, basically pine needles, that in a bad winter, deer and elk will eat pine needles, which they don't otherwise eat, and it causes an abortion. So making pine needle tea, yeah, all of those will work, but they will poison your entire body and so that you are at risk of death or other injury, so don't do it. But there are those methods of doing it. We also, of course, get people jumping on someone's stomach, throwing themselves down the stairs, all of those kind of extreme uh, measures, massive doses of contraceptions if you could get them. Um, the other women who uh, sought those abortions, let me tell you, one of... The young women that I interviewed, she was 16 at the time, and she didn't feel she was competent to have a child. She went to Dr. Williamson up in Shelby, and he's the one who put her up in the stirrups and had bloody uh, equipment in a bowl, and she decided she was out of there and was not going to undergo that. Other women were lucky to get to Dr. Sadie, who took good care of them, gave them a number of... Um, uh, tansy or penny royal or something to sort of get it started and then did the procedures after that and the women who went to them often said she was so compassionate and caring. One of those was a woman who um, didn't live in town but her mother who was a nurse figured out who the abortionist was in Miles City and took her daughter and she said that um, Dr. Sadie was more than happy to do the abortion on her even though she was married, talk, tried to talk her out, but it was okay, until she revealed that as a white woman, she was married to an African-American man. And then as a condition of doing the abortion, Dr. Sadie insisted that she agree to divorce him. Their marriage was on the rocks anyway. But um, So, I mean, these are all complicated in race issues, uh, economic income, and those issues. One reason we didn't bring up and work on um, the issue of Native Americans and uh, abortion is I have talked to, I grew up on the Fort Peck Reservation and I've talked to a number of women who are, have powerful skills in this area as Native Americans, but the issue in the 1970s when we were doing this was really the genocide for Native American people and the issue of forced sterilization. Native women were being sterilized against their will all the time on reservations. When they would go in to have a baby, the doctor would just decide, you know, shouldn't, Indians shouldn't have any more kids, and they would just sterilize them. 
So that was the issue that some of us were working on in a different way, women of all red nation were working on. So it was not the focus of this topic, uh, which was primarily for immigrant women and uh, white European women. Um, another woman who uh, got an abortion at the time, if you were a woman in, even up into the 80s and got pregnant and weren't married, there was incredible public uh, shame and other kinds of negative things that could happen to you. One of them was a teacher, and when the man she was involved with would not marry her when she was pregnant, she said, I had to get an abortion. I would have lost my job. You can't have a pregnant woman who's teacher. It's a, it was a morals clause for many, many years for women. So there are economic reasons that many women chose to have an abortion. The reason most of them said they did it was uh, because they simply could not afford to have a child. Their response to it in the end was relief, that it was incredible relief to have actually finished it. But the commitment of some, like the young woman I had read earlier, to make sure this never happened to another woman was really what motivated myself and many of the other women of the day to work on uh, the abortion control and those other related issues. I could go on forever about this, but I won't. Well, I could go on forever about it, but I want to know what you think, questions. I did this once for all the whammy medical students, witchy whammy medical students in Bozeman, and all the old doctors from Bozeman came, and they're all going there like this, and all the young medical students were going, oh my God, oh my God, did they really do that? Yes, they did. Um, and I know with the danger that abortion is in these days, some people will think they can go back and, well, I hope a lot of women and men will organize to make sure that abortion is always safe and legal. In lieu of that, we all know that there are services arising for uh, mail order medications to provide abortions. And I know a number of us in the early days said if it became illegal, just like the Jane women in Chicago, we would just get trained and do them. It is not that medically difficult to do an abortion. So there are other options out there, but hopefully we won't return to the day where you're literally taking your life in your hands by trying to secure an abortion because it's Russian roulette and you have no idea um, whether you're going to get a competent provider or you're going to end up dead. I can talk about a lot of other individuals if you would like. What are your questions? So, we'll just have people ask questions instead of writing them down. Yeah, that's fine. Jan Van Riper over here. So, in, in your research in Montana, did you find many um, women who were underage, say less than 18 or 21, I guess it was 18 men, who were seeking abortions and perhaps died? I was just curious. Well, remember in that day, sexuality wasn't quite as free for really young people. But here, let me read the ages of this. 40-some that I've got here, 21, misses somebody, 21, misses somebody, 24, Irma who's 25, unmarried, 18, 21, misses so-and-so, 18, 21, 18, 34, 30, uh, 24, 17, 23, 30, 32, 32, 34, 19, uh, 27, 24, 21, 33. I mean, that gives you a sense of the range. But yeah, they could start out as, particularly the young unmarried ones who maybe are seeing someone, as they put it, in most of the coroners. The coroners inquests are remarkable, as you would know, because they do call witnesses and different people do testify. Yeah, I knew her. She was seeing so-and-so. Um, this one uh, literally broke my heart reading it. Um, she was a domestic servant, which was the leading occupation for women at the time seeing some man. Uh, he did not marry her. She got an abortion and died of it. When they asked the man at the coroner's inquest why he didn't marry her, he said, why would you buy a horse when you could ride one for free? And I have never gotten over that comment, ever. Never will, never. So yeah, and so, does that answer it? Yeah. Bob? Uh, did you? see any difference or were you able to find, for example, economic status and the people who were very, very rich, were they getting these services through the kinds of um, 
you know, doctors and et cetera that, that you were researching with, or, or were, were, was that kind of out because it was such a stigma and a very private and secret? Well, you can bet even until the 1970s that if you were a woman of means, that you would know you could go to the state of Washington, you could fly to Japan, you could fly to New York, you could fly to California, and probably your personal physician would take care of it without, unless you died, uh, you would have the best health care possible. No, these are mostly people who are, as Blanche Judge said, yes, there was one physician who worked on respectable women, and then the others worked on all the rest of the women. You know, the immigrants are... Uh, there's a couple of African-American women in here, young women who don't have any other resources. Other questions? Come on. It's fun. So uh, when you said 42 deaths, that was between 18, the late 1800s and throughout? Mm -hmm. That's only in six communities. Oh, just the six communities. Okay. Are there any... <coughs> Do you have, like... When you're doing that research, did you have these or like ideas about how you can estimate how many attempted, or is that just a total fool's error? Well, I don't know. It's a fool's error, but statistically, it's really hard. Like I said, as we got into it, you had to sort of make a judgment: is this abortionist someone who's just doing nothing but abortions, and so a high volume of abortions, and so if they have a certain number of deaths. It's probably within an acceptable range given you don't have antibiotics, or is this person really medically incompetent? You have so I would make a judgment call, but um, I I just plain don't know. You you don't know how many were attempted. I mean, the a number of the women that I interviewed, of course, they had all had abortions and they survived. So my assumption is that the majority of women did survive these abortions, or it wouldn't have continued. But the big difference, again, between dying and not dying is a competent, actually a medically trained provider of whatever level, and an the growth of antibiotics after World War II. Technology, a wonderful thing. Other questions? Jan Van Riper again. So two questions, two more questions. One is, um, what is the status of last session the legislature passed some very restrictive abortion measures? And I, my sense is that if those have been held unconstitutional at the district court level and might be going up to the Supreme Court, but am I wrong? I, I don't know the status of those. That's my first question. You want to rejoin this conversation? There were, I think, six measures. Four went to the court, and they've been held. I mean, they were told they're unconstitutional to start off with. They're done. Um, one that passed did not go into effect, which was a constitutional, to place a constitutional amendment on the ballot to define not privacy, but to amend the um, equal protection section of the Constitution because it says no person, and then they define person as from conception. So not going after, the, this is the second or third time they've done that one. Um, so they're not going after the privacy one directly, they're going over the definition of personhood. And that was three votes short of the supermajority of 100 required to place it on the ballot. So my assumption is they will try that one again. And then the other one that the legislature could put on just by basis of having a majority is the LR-131 that is on the ballot, the Born Alive uh, statute, which, you know, should it pass, the court, I believe, will find also unconstitutional. Um, it's both medically unnecessary, it's already covered under law, it's nothing but a dog whistle for the right wing to turn out thinking, you know, babies are aborted in the ninth month and someone just leaves them on a side table to die. I mean, it's really about compassion for families who are having a wanted pregnancy, for the most part, and are finding that that child is not viable, doesn't have a brain, doesn't have whatever it takes to stay alive. And the practice in medicine is compassionate care, is to work with the family, do what the family wants, wrap that child up, 
give it to the parents to hold while it dies, not pick it up, take it over there, rip open its little hearts, shove tubes down it to try to keep it alive for another hour out of fear that your doctor is going to be sent to prison for not doing everything possible to keep it alive for every minute possible. That's what's on the ballot. And it's not Planned Parenthood doing abortions or Blue Mountain. These are procedures that are done in hospitals by regular medical providers of people who are going through a pregnancy, expecting to have a living child, and it's not going to happen because of these extreme events that happen. So that measure is on the ballot. That's what's happened to that. For years, we never worried about it. I mean, I'm the senior person in judiciary because we knew they'd pass these things if they could, and then the governor would veto them. But these days, the governor supports it, and so those, these are the issues that are really at the core of the danger of watching the Constitution and the court be gutted out, the Constitution replaced within the next three to five years to reflect that conservative perspective versus the protection of people's rights. And that's what I expect it's doing. And they're two votes short of having the 100 required votes to put these measures on the ballot to change the definition of personhood to call for a constitutional convention. We are in very grave danger. And part two of your question. Question number two is, for those of us who, you know, have been kind of aware of this stuff but kind of dropped out of any active, active action, any action on it, we, you know, the last several years, what, I mean, what, what are, what are organizations, there's strength in numbers, any suggestions about what to do? With who? Who? Ms. Dudek, do you want to come up and take that? This is a, a team effort here. All right. So I'd like to focus your attention. First of all, we have some tables out there. Well, they aren't our tables. We have people tabling out there. And it is Montana Women Vote. They're making sure people are registered to vote. Make sure you're registered. Um, the, you could have your registration. You think it's valid, but it could not be. However, you still can do same-day voter registration because those laws were found to be unconstitutional, like many of these laws, and much of our tax dollars are being wasted. I'll get off my soapbox. Millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. Susan Wickland Fund is also out there. They're another group that you could support. Um, Compassion for Families, no on LR131. They're the, it's the group, no on LR131. We have two people who are gathering signatures for that, so I'm not sure exactly where they're at right now, but they will have, I told them to kind of wait around when we leave if you want to add your signature to that. But another group that's working on that is the Blue Mountains Women's Clinic and their executive director is here, and she's also at one of the tables out there. So they're also another good group to engage with, as well as the Missoula County Dems. If you wanna look at what we can do to protect choices, get some Democrats elected. We have a couple of candidates here, as well as a couple of elected officials, but I think they had to leave to a city council meeting. But um, they need our support. Uh, they need money to be able to get their message out. They need people to help them knock doors, make phone calls, or even just spread the word to their family and friends about who they should vote for and why. So um, as far as those are kind of some groups that are out there, there are, you know, Planned Parenthood is another one, but if you wanna look at real local action, because that's where our action needs to be, those are good groups to get involved with and to encourage also, even encourage, you know, younger people. I have some, te you know, teenagers and preteens. They're aware of these issues and they're concerned because they're, it's their rights and their future that we need to be concerned about. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody have other any suggestions? Any other questions for Diane or any other, yeah, suggestions? I, I don't think I heard you mention in your interviews anything about um, rape or incest. Do people talk about that to you or in a they, they weren't in any of these. That doesn't mean it certainly didn't happen. But no, they didn't come up in any of these. So you can trace the laws back to Bannock. Uh, mm -hmm. Montana's got a long history of law mm -hmm. justice and vigilantism even long after we had laws. Um, did any of these doctors or these women face any of that sort of thing that you could find? Or? Well, the women didn't because they were either dead and there was a trial or 
nobody knew about it, and I was the first one they talked to. There are uh, other times there were active groups. 1971, Dorothy Bradley, her freshman year, um, carried the first bill I could find that we would call a pro-choice bill at the request of a group called Moral, Montana Organization for the Repeal of Abortion Laws, which was AAUW and the League of Women Voters. Maxine uh, Johnson, some of you may have known her, was a university person who kind of carried that. And uh, Dorothy, in her recent biography, talked about it a little bit. She got kind of suckered into carrying it because nobody else would touch it. And she was a freshman, so freshmen do these things. And she took it, and it got five votes. Five votes. And that was before Roe. But, you know, you got to speak up. I mean, I think that's, it was dangerous in those days to publicly even discuss it. So, I mean, it was against the law to refer certain people or to have some of those public discussions. But there's so many different ways to still research this. If anybody's got a thing and wants to get involved in some research, I could, you know, when I was doing all this, there wasn't even interest good photocopying. So you were hand copying coroner's notes. So there's a lot of work, I think, to do more on this topic, whatever your angle might be, whether it's the medical side of it, women's personal stories, um, the whole underworld thing. You know, I'm really curious about things like Representative Arnie Olson, when he was Attorney General, went on a binge in 59, I think it was, cleaning up the state for morality. He went after gambling. Uh, he raided the different uh, gambling houses and houses of prostitution. And of course, they all were forewarned because they were all taking bribes, and they all just disappeared the minute somebody showed up to collect all of that stuff. But he must have been involved in this as well. And so there's so many interests. The role of the Catholic Church in this is interesting. Um, the role of, in hospitals, if you could get a legal abortion, it was because there was a board, like at St. Pat's and others, there was a board of a couple physicians and the religious clergy who would interview you and make a decision if it was appropriate for you, like risk to the life of the mother, maybe an incest or rape case, maybe, and they would decide whether it, you could have an abortion. Clearly, most people never went through that process, and by the time they did, it was too late anyway, but, so. Yes? So I have two questions for you. Um, can you answer whichever order you like? <clears throat> um, I want to hear more about the doctor in Helena who oh, Dr. Killo? Yeah, multiple juries and mistrials, and um, let me hear you go off and uh, tell us more about that. Um, and the other thing was in, I think it was 1980 or 81, uh, Ronald Reagan appointed C. Everett Koop as his attorney general, um, and he was tasked with doing an investigation to determine about the psychological harm to women who have had an abortion. And you have all this anecdotal uh, evidence, and uh, you spent all this time interviewing people, and you gave us a really good uh, summation about how many of them felt relief, um, but I was wondering what more you found in addition to that. Um, if you well, and that comes up every legislative session. People come up and testify and said, "Yeah, I had an abortion and I regret it," and that's fine. You know, people make decisions in their life and they live with the consequences of it. The question is, who gets to make that decision? Is it that person or is it someone else? I mean, do you get to be? political agent, a moral agent in your own life, or do you think somebody else should save you from yourself that you, you know, which is really the tradition that women shouldn't make decisions for themselves. So yeah, certainly some people have regretted it for various kinds of reasons, uh, but for the vast majority, and I think this is true for the, a quarter of all women in the United States have had abortions. If they all regretted it, it would not be done so commonly, you know. So, oh, you want to know about uh, Dr. Kellogg and Dr. Elijah Hoyt. Their pictures are out in the front as well. And there was an article in uh, about 20 years ago in the Montana Magazine of Western History. Um, um, a historian from South Carolina did a little bit of an article on, on uh, Dr. Kellogg and his various trials, because he was just a so in your face kind of person in the Helena scene racing around in his uh, horse and carriage, people would say. I mean, he wasn't hiding at all. He was just, and I think it's really quite clear 
in a couple, he's going to, he sit a retired governor to come in and testify to his good behavior. And, you know, I mean, this is like corruption at the highest level in my view. But, you know, clearly someone in the legal system had decided that he really needed to be put out of business. And normally if you had been tried once or twice, it would have broken you financially if nothing else and you just couldn't go on. That didn't stop him. I mean, he continued to practice till he died. Now, they also practiced in private sanitariums. You might want to think about this. I mean, where women gave birth and where these things were done, you had a hospital, but most of the people who were uh, practicing what we would call an OBGYN had a maternity or a lying-in hospital. It was the standard way where women, if they didn't give birth at home, would begin to be going to these official places to give birth. And so... Um, those facilities were owned and run by these providers. So, you know, Dr. Sadie, you would come to her lying in home and be a patient there and stay there for three to five days or whatever. And so these procedures are done in a place they own with their own staff. And again, the only person in the room, usually when these procedures happen, are the provider and the woman. So the possibility of being testified against by a lot of other people unless someone else brought another doctor in from the outside to look at it. Clearly, who shows up is the coroner in the end when they die, who goes in and says, yes, you know, the uterus is a mess. We see all these signs of basically infection. There, this is clearly a result of an abortion. So on the death certificate, it'll say, you know, death is a result of, uh, that there's evidence of a procedure having been done three to five days prior to this and this massive infection. So, and then the same, and the attending physician is Dr. Sadie or whomever. So, and that's the case in Elijah or in uh, Dr. Kellogg, you know, and again, if you're delivering babies and you're also dealing with miscarriages, which are extremely common among women, so you are dealing in dead fetuses as part of your regular above board OBGYN practice, who's to prove and say that a woman who chose to go in there for this procedure and you now have a, a box of dead fetuses is not a legitimate result of your legitimate work as a physician working with pregnant women. Very difficult to prove. So usually when they get uh, hauled in somewhere into the legal system. It's for egregious behavior. Somebody finally can't take it anymore. Usually the organized doctors, or in the case of Dr. Elijah Hoyt here, uh, the Catholic attorneys and the Catholic county attorney. They are the Catholic mafia who decide to take out you Haas in the end, but don't succeed. Yeah. Your list of women They're not even charged that I found. I mean, doesn't mean somebody was, but none that I found. I mean, I think that was, you know, we have that debate even now. Um, most of the legislation around this topic targets the abortion provider, but they always talk about, repeatedly, I don't think they've ever passed one, that says we should also charge the woman. So that's not uncommon. And there's a history of violence. Someone asked the violence question. I mean, to my degree, the women weren't attacked. But even when abortion's been legal in this state since 72, we have had repeated acts of violence in this state. Blue Mountain Women's Clinic was burned to the ground, and we rebuilt it. Uh, Susan Wickland, her place was bombed with chemicals. Jim Armstrong burned out. Um, and we had, uh, and the national scene, a number of abortion providers who were assassinated. Assassinated. Every abortion provider I knew has super high security. A lot of them carry a gun. A lot of them wear um, protective clothing and go to fairly extreme measures because they are at high risk of being, and I fear for that as we go into this stage where other states are now saying, yes, it's illegal, so you know, it's murder in North Dakota, and yet you're murdering people in Montana and it's legal. Well, I'm going to do something about that. And so my fear is that increase in violence 
may happen here. The other fear of the providers here is that if you were a provider doing a legal service here for a woman from a state like North Dakota where it is a crime, that North Dakota will decide to charge and extradite a physician from Montana to North Dakota. I was recently invited to the White House to meet with the Vice President on this topic with four legislators from more four other states. And when we were talking about this issue, she said, yes, that's an interstate commerce issue. Do you think you were coming to hear something about interstate commerce? This is an interstate commerce issue. So it is very complex legally in now that all states have different kinds of rules and laws, federal law in very odd ways applies, such as the healthcare laws saying that hospitals, if you want your federal money for anything, you are gonna take care of women who have this health need, period. Or the discussion going on about, when it came up in the White House, I went, someone said, well, we're looking at the option of, of provision of services on federal land, and I thought, in the forest? <laughs> what? And someone said, no, we're talking about military bases. I thought, okay. So yeah, they are talking about military bases being kind of a safe zone of federal land in which uh, abortion providers could act. I don't know that that will ever come, but they're looking at all of those kinds of options. So, and that has to do with military law and all kinds of other things. So it's a very complicated quilt out there right now in which we don't know how it's gonna play out. We simply don't. I mean. I'm really grateful that the Biden administration has and the vice president has convened groups of attorneys general from states and in the Department of Justice groups of attorneys with specialties in things like interstate commerce or different kinds of healthcare law who are going to navigate these cases as they start going to court. Questions? I have a couple of uh, I guess comments and a question. Um, I don't like to rag on men or the super rich but I'm going to. Um, I, you know, I, when I was young, I got involved in the legal system, and um, I thought that there was one legal system in this country. And as I've gotten older, and just recently, I realized there's two legal systems, one for the rich and one for the poor. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's the same with abortion, that there's a system for the rich and there's a, a, a system for the poor. And I, I do a lot of work in, um, companies in, on the HR side and payroll side of things, and I don't remember how long ago, but the government instituted a, a law that um, if you hire a new employee, you have to put their name and tax um, social security number into a system, and then that system will identify if they have children that are on um, public mm -hmm. assistance of any kind, and then you, you as an employer, you garnish their check. Um, I can't remember, and I don't think I've ever garnished a check of a woman. I have seen situations where I've garnished checks of men, and they're one step ahead of the garnishment. They'll, they'll, they'll literally quit a job. Rather than pay child support. Yeah, yeah to not pay child support. And, and go work somewhere else until the state catch, catches up with them and then they'll go to the next state or the next job or, or whatever. But my question is, what do you think are the um, possible successes of having a tax on men? Oh, God. You silly man. <laughs> and yes, there's always been different medical services available to the rich than to the rest of us. But you bringing up businesses is interesting because that is one of the groups as well that the vice president has been convening. And if you've seen following this issue, it's interesting the number of businesses that have now stepped up and said, yes, we will provide these services, make sure they're covered for our employees, and they will have the time off to go get their health care needs met. That is a huge step in uh, the direction of advocating and protecting this. Uh, which has never happened before. I think businesses have always remained very silent on this topic. But, you know, I think that's what's kind of interesting about this. So the advocacy groups or business communities, the faith community is coming together around this issue. Legislators and public policy people, obviously. Hospitals are going to have to come together because it's their liability that really is at stake with these issues. They are the most reticent and the most... Um, 
cautious than medical associations to take public positions. But there is work to be done, no matter what it is. Yeah. Because I think that, uh, you know, it's been said before, but, but this to me is, is the state or the government or the rich or however you want to articulate it coming after women's rights. And you men don't think they're not going to come after yours next. Well, and that's why I think this issue has evolved to something different. This is not just about abortion rights. Right. Not in right. the slightest, and has not been framed that way correctly. It is about your right to control your own life. It's about privacy, whether it's who you marry, who you love, everything, all of it. And I think people get that. And that's why I think, in some degree, this issue may save democracy in this era, because finally people will go up and say, well, I wasn't you know, I'm in no danger at my age of having an abortion, but it does affect my life and my choices. And if they take that away, they're going to take away, I mean, thank goodness Chief uh, Justice Thomas laid it right out there and he said it, just like Derek Skies said, you know, the Constitution's a socialist rag and it should be repealed. They're telling us what they intend to do. Believe them. Believe them. So I think with that, that's a pretty good end for Diane. Let's give her a round of applause. And, and thank those courageous people who provide services to women in this area. Take it upon yourself and go thank an abortionist for what they do. They deserve it. They need it. Thank you, Do you want to stand up here with me for 10 more minutes? No. Okay. Okay. We're good. Okay. So we have about 10 more minutes, and um, I just want to say, wow, right? We know where we're going. We don't have to wonder what's going to happen now that Roe versus Wade doesn't exist anymore. We've seen it happening in other states. We've seen people being prosecuted, thrown in jail, people dying. And it's going to happen if we don't keep our Constitution here. As Diane said, we are at risk of two votes away of a Republican supermajority where they can call a new constitutional convention, confuse people, and then violate all of our rights and eviscerate the constitutional rights we have now. So it matters if you vote. Anyone who thinks your vote doesn't matter, some of these legislative races come down to one vote. I once won a race by 49 votes. That's not that many. I mean, it matters if you vote. So make sure you're registered. Make sure you vote. And the other thing that we need to make sure we do is that we need to make sure people understand how important our Supreme Court is, that we have an independent Supreme Court that's not politicized. It is disgusting what we're seeing right now in one of the Supreme Court races where it's become highly politicized and partisan, where we have elected people on the Republican side holding fundraisers for a Supreme Court justice candidate when they're supposed to be impartial. So I encourage all of you to vote for Ingrid Gustafson. She is the good impartial justice. Yeah, seriously. And if you can afford it all, even $5, send some money her way. She's up against big money that is trying to violate our rights and take over our Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is the backstop that is ruling that these rules that our legislature passed are illegal. So we need to make sure that we keep our Supreme Court. So those are two things that are protecting our rights. I just wanted to talk a little bit more about what we can do at a local level to protect our constitutional rights. In Montana, as Diane said, we have a right, a right to privacy in our constitution. And that right is specific. And it's been upheld by our Supreme Court to say that it includes the right to procreative autonomy. That means you control your body, your, your spouse, your partner controls their body, and what happens to it. There was an interesting comment about it's not just a women's issue. So that's actually a really understudied area. But there has been one study done rather recently that showed that most men, one out of four, one out of five men, has been involved with somebody who's had an abortion, whether they knew it or not. And for those people who were college age, age and were male, if their person that they were with, if their partner had an abortion, they were much more likely to complete higher education, have a much um, higher earning potential than those who were with someone who did not have an abortion and who chose to keep that pregnancy. So it just goes to show that having that ability to choose one way or the other matters. And it does impact males. It impacts your sons. It impacts your grandsons. It impacts your nephews and what's going to happen to them. So. With that in mind, we do have that right in Montana, 
But we can do more um, at a state level if we want to ensure that we have a pro-choice a pro state. In our state right now, we're kind of in a, pro, in a bind because our governor and our legislature are not pro-choice. They're kind of anti-freedom, anti-choice. But if we were in a state that was more pro-choice, you could do a few things to protect choice. One is to ensure your constitution or your laws enshrine the right to privacy or the right to procreative autonomy. So that's something that could be done. It's already done here in Montana. We just have to keep it at this point. The other thing to be done is to ensure that insurance coverage covers abortion care. And that's something that you may want to check on your insurance if it covers it or not. And that's actually a conversation if you care enough that you could have with your provider if you want them to make sure that they include that coverage for others. Another thing to do is provide at a state level clinic, organizational, and individual support. This is something that places like Oregon have done where they've allocated $15 million to be distributed to choice, agent, choice organizations to help with pro-choice efforts. And a uh, fourth thing to do is expand the pool of clinicians offering services. This goes back historically to what Diane was talking about, that the, the well, I don't think it was valid doctors, but that the official doctors didn't want the other people doing the care. Well, what we want to see happen at, for uh, reproductive services is have not only medical physicians, but also physician's assistants and midwives and others be able to provide that kind of care. And states such as Connecticut are expanding their laws to allow people like midwives and others to provide that care. So we hear a lot of bad news happening, but there are states that uh, are actually working to support choice. A majority of Americans support choice. A 2021 Gallup poll showed that only a, a very small minority, 19%, wanted abortion completely illegal. So a majority of Americans want this. It's just our lawmakers in some states and our Supreme Court right now are out of touch with what the rest of America wants. So we have to make sure we put pressure on them to let them know we won't stand for it. Uh, the last thing that we can do at a state level is provide legal protections for clinicians or others who provide this care. And this goes back to what Diane was talking about, the interstate commerce issues. Does anybody even know what that is? I know there's a lawyer or two in the audience, and you probably do. But it's basically that you can't have different rules from one state to the next that don't make sense. Like you can't have a um, license plate that's valid in one state but not valid in the next. Could you imagine driving to Idaho, Washington, Oregon, and having to change your plate each time? Well, that's now what they've done with abortion and, and with, with marijuana, too, actually. But if you look at, you can't, that's what an interstate commerce is. And so we're having these issues right now where it's like state against state. We have to figure that out. But what a state can do is ensure that its medical providers are not going to be prosecuted and brought to another state where they will not cooperate in those investigations and they will not allow another state to provide or to try and take their providers away. So those are some things at a state level. In Montana, not going to happen because we don't have that state level, but we do have local level control. At a city and county level, we can do things that can't be done at a state level because different rules apply. So I just want to go briefly over some of these things because it's what we should be thinking about because we can do this now even in, if we have an anti-choice state or an anti-choice environment. We can still do these things locally. They generally fall into uh, five categories and they deal with education, data management, legal processes, internet access, which you wouldn't really think about, and coordination and support of advocacy. And just uh, quickly, because we only have seven minutes now, so if you have questions, you might have one minute for this afterwards. Education can be that hospitals can ensure that their providers know um, they have accurate training on abortion and that people know um, what the laws are in those localities, but also that the, ed that the hospital care providers, the abortion providers, the doctors, the medical providers, that they know how to accurately document ectopic pregnancies, miscarriages, and other issues that may arise related to um, um, a pregnancy mismanagement or lack of abortion care availability. So we want to make sure that those things are, if you live in an anti-choice state, which we do not, but that those things are documented. In our state, we're more concerned about privacy and that we don't want to see that information handed to prosecution or law enforcement for any sort of prosecution of the medical providers, which is what's historically happened. Or 
that it violates the privacy of patients. So you want to work there with your hospitals and you want, you don't have to do it, but you want your elected officials, your, our mayor was here earlier, as well as one of our county commissioners. You want them to start putting the pressure on those local hospitals to make sure they have the proper education and documentation going on. And with data management, that's the same thing. You want our hospitals to make sure that their records are safe and that they are not just going to give them to law enforcement or anybody else who comes asking for those records. And you want to make sure that the, the information being kept is only what's necessary. Everything that's ever happened to a woman related to her pregnancy or her pregnancy history does not need to be included. And so you want to have your hospitals work with medical providers to limit the amount of information that they're putting in there. It's unfortunate that this is you know, what we have to talk about, but it's the day and age we're living in, and we don't want to give people information that can be used to harm, um, harm them later. We don't want to give it to hospitals if they don't need it, or law enforcement if they're just going to use it to prosecute them. Uh, a third thing to do is using our legal processes. Now, this is even occurring in places like Texas, which are very anti-choice right now, but we're seeing some city or county district attorneys who refuse to prosecute their anti-abortion cases. So they can make a public statement saying, we may have these laws, but I will not prosecute these cases. I will not prosecute somebody for taking medication to assist them to have an abortion. I will not prosecute a, a somebody who's helped somebody else get an abortion. So we can contact our district, city, or county attorneys. We only have city and county attorneys in Montana, but other places they call them district, and tell them that we don't want them prosecuting these cases. Again, in Montana, we don't have to worry about it yet, but it's something that we need to be thinking about. And then we can also ensure that our hospitals have policies that don't allow things like police to question a woman when she's in the hospital seeking care for a pregnancy or a miscarriage. We don't want them to be um, questioning the person then. And we can also bar local officials such as law enforcement from cooperating with out-of-state investigations if somebody comes from it like North Dakota to Montana to receive an abortion, we could have our local officials bar our law enforcement from cooperating in that investigation. So your tax dollars aren't going to go support this North Dakota investigation where they're going to prosecute somebody who received an abortion. So those are all things that we can ask our local officials to do and that we can demand them to do if we, they want our vote because they're there to represent us, we pay them, and that they need to hear from us what we want. Another thing that we can see that has been shown to help is internet access. Who here has a smartphone? Or two, you know, and iPads and everything else in the world. Well, you may not, if you're gonna be looking uh, at tracking your um, ovulation, or if you're gonna be looking up abortion providers, you may not want that information on your phone because if somebody gets a search warrant for this, it would be on here and that could be used to prosecute you if you were in a state that's gonna be prosecuting those sorts of crimes. So what we want is to have our local communities have wonderful public libraries like we have here to allow internet access there that's free and that people can search for that kind of information there. They won't leave a digital footprint on their own phone and it can't be used to prosecute them. We wanna make sure that the libraries um, publicize that it's available and that they, the people know that they can come and use this that service if they need to. You could also have an easily accessed portal of information if people have questions about abortion laws or if they have questions about medical care that they can call and ask for information. It could be done through the public health department or you could do something even again at the library. They're a portal of information and a lot of people use them. So um, that is something else that we can do. Last and, and my favorite is we can require our, our elected officials that tell them that we want them to be vocal supporters of pro-choice legislation and pro-choice issues. We can tell them that we want them to stand up for our rights, whether it's here in Missoula and we want our city council to speak here, pass an ordinance in support of reproductive autonomy like they did up in Whitefish. Or we could have the, we could say that we know that we live in Missoula and some people may look askance at us sometimes, but we want you to go to Helena, we want you to go to Bozeman, and we want you to speak up for reproductive rights because that's what we need. We want our elected officials to be our voices to our community, to our state, and really make a stand about what we think is important. So those are all things we could ask our officials to do, get their email addresses and start emailing them. The squeaky wheel gets the grease, so the more we do it, the more of a concerted movement we make, the more difference we'll make. So, oh, I only have one minute. Any, any one question? Yes? So that was an awesome list. Is it posted somewhere? Funny you should ask. 
I happen to have written a book on it as well as a workbook that I'm actually going to be making publicly available very soon. But it is, it's already available and I can actually, um, if you email me, I'll just give you my email right now. Just email info at ppir.org. We're the ones who put this on the public policy to the Rockies, and I can get you that information. You can also reach out to me on Facebook or on other social media, uh, Kimberly Dudick, D-U-D-I-K, and, and I'll provide you with that information. And we need to actually work together if we're going to want to protect our rights. We're in the fight of our lives. We don't want to go back to the past. Knowing that government overreach into our intimate details of our lives and family planning results in disastrous situations like we heard about earlier. We need to work together to make sure we protect our rights and that ensure that our rights aren't violated. So we can do this together. We're stronger together and we can keep fighting the good fight. With that, it is seven o'clock and we are done. Thank you everyone for coming.